The Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels because it omits the Beatitudes and the birth stories, the genealogies, and it omits some parables that are found in the other synoptic Gospels. So most scholars are convinced that the Gospel of Mark came first among the four Gospels, and they think that in composing their Gospels, Matthew and Luke use Mark's source, and they also use a hypothetical second source called Q. There are many miracles mentioned in the first eight chapters, casting out unclean spirit, healing Peter's mother-in-law, cleansing a leper, these three are in chapter one, healing a paralyzed man, healing a man with a withered hand, chapters two and three. In chapter four, we are calming a storm, chapter five, casting out demons and raising Jairus' daughter, and healing a woman with a hemorrhage. In chapter six, there's a feeding of the 5,000 and walking on the sea. In chapter seven, there's casting out the demon from the Syrophoenician woman's daughter and healing of a deaf mute. There's a lot going on there, and the stories are, for the most part, shorter and moving pretty quickly. Certainly in chapter one, you see eight subheadings in the gospel, chapter one. You see another four subheadings in chapter two. You see four more subheadings in chapter three and five in chapter four, another two in chapter five. In chapter six, five more subheadings, chapter seven, three, and chapter eight, six. So that makes 37 subheadings, 37 possible stories in the first eight chapters. And we are in chapter eight. And the last three subheadings are the focus for our session today. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus predicts his death and the way of the cross. This week's passage, Mark 8, 27 through 9, 1, marks a great divide in the gospel. Not only does it represent the middle of the gospel, it also appears to be the heart of the gospel and Mark's purpose for writing. At this juncture, the emphasis shifts from miracles to teaching, from crowds to disciples, and from Galilee to Jerusalem. At this point, the disciples also begin to recognize who Jesus really is. Jesus is setting the stage with a question designed to start focusing his disciples thinking on who he truly is. So he asks, who do people say that I am? He's also set in the context for the more probing question, but what about you? Who do you say I am? No longer are we discussing other people's opinions and the correctness thereof. We are now probing our understanding and our relationship with Jesus. So the question is asked and the disciples have to give an answer. We know who answers first and loudest. Peter, he says, you are the Messiah. The question is, what does Messiah actually mean to a Jewish man raised in the Jewish tradition? Isaiah 42, he will be a servant of God. Second Samuel 7, he will build the kingdom of God and that kingdom will be eternal. Psalm 72, he will be a national hero who will vanquish the enemies of Israel. Isaiah 11, he will have wonderful abilities. He will engage in acts of moral judgment. His success will be the result of spiritual activities. And Isaiah 42 again, he will be a light to the nations. Isaiah 53 says he will be stricken and he will be a stricken and suffering figure who will bear the pain of society. And of course, he is going to be of the lineage of David. These are the things that a Jew would be anticipating in the coming Messiah. Certainly the idea of a national hero who will vanquish the enemies of Israel is suggesting that the person comes with power. Let's take a look at the Mark account as well as the Matthew account. Mark chapter eight from verse 27, Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. This is in Gentile territory around the location of Mount Hermon. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. If you take a look at the synoptic for Matthew, you will see that there's well, a little more. For example, 
in verse 14. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets, whereas in the Mark version, it doesn't mention Jeremiah, just as one of the prophets, which would include Jeremiah. Then we come to verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The son of the living God. And Jesus replied. So we see that Jesus responded in Mark saying, don't tell anyone. He warned them not to tell anyone about him. And verse 20 of the Matthew version, 16, 20, has that particular statement. But then there's 17 through 19, three long verses where Jesus explains to Simon that he, his knowledge that Jesus was the son of the living God did not come to him by flesh and blood, but it was revealed to him by spirit. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, name change, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but the mere human concerns. Verse 34, he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. They also did a comparison between Mark and Luke. Notice that Mark goes on for several verses while Luke devotes one verse, verse 22. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day to be raised to life. There's no mention of Peter and the rebuke that Peter gets as a consequence of attempting to rebuke Jesus. I'd like to focus on the idea of a suffering Messiah, an interesting concept. There are a few songs that help us to wrap our mind around this, especially as we approach the Lenten season. I'm thinking of a song that says, I'll follow thee of life the giver. I'll follow thee suffering redeemer. I'll follow thee, deny thee never. By thy grace, I will follow thee. The first verse of the song says, I heard a voice so gently calling, take up thy cross and follow me. A tempest on my heart was falling, a living cross this was to be. I struggled sore, I struggled vainly, no other light my eyes could see. I'll follow thee of life the giver, I'll follow thee suffering redeemer. I'll follow thee, deny thee never, by thy grace I'll follow thee. There's a more contemporary song by ancient and modern standards, a more recent addition to hymnody, and it says, I walked one day along a country road, and there a stranger journey too, bent low beneath the burden of his load, it was a cross, a cross I knew. Take up thy cross and follow me, I hear the blessed Savior call, how can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus gave his all? I love the second verse which says, I cried, Lord Jesus, and he spoke my name. I saw his hands all bruised and torn. I stooped to kiss away the marks of shame, the shame for me that he had borne. Verse 3, Oh, let me bear thy cross, dear Lord, I cried. And lo, a cross appeared for me, the one forgotten I had cast aside, the one so long that I had feared. Another well-known song says, On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best 
for a world of lost sinners was slain. Back to the idea of a suffering Savior and a suffering Messiah. Jesus, precious Savior, thou hast saved my soul. I think that's the song. One of the verses says, From the lowly manger I will follow thee. In the desert and the strife near thee I will be. Even the sufferings of the cross I will gladly bear. And with thee in heaven I a crown shall wear. In pledging oneself to the cause to follow Christ, to the tune Finlandia, it says, Thou art the way, none other dare I follow. Thou art the truth, and thou hast made me free. Thou art the life, the hope of my tomorrow. Thou art the Christ who died for me. This is my creed, that mid earth's sin and sorrow, my life may guide men unto thee. Who did people in Jesus' day think Messiah was going to be? Even his disciples, what assumptions might they have held about Messiah? I mentioned the characteristics of the Messiah that the Jews saw in Scripture, and this is what they were looking for. If we were to focus today on what people say and who they think Jesus is or was, we come across many different religions and many branches of even Christianity where people have alternative ideas of who Jesus is. Some think he's a great prophet. Some think he's a good teacher. Some think that he is just a man and he is not God. And of course, there are those of us who believe that he is indeed God incarnate. Question number four asks, why do you suppose Jesus made his question to Peter so personal? I think he asked the question of the disciples and Peter was the one who was so bold to respond. Peter's response, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Which Messiah? The Jewish Messiah? It's hard to know. With the whole country anticipating Messiah and people thinking about Messiah, they're going to leave what they're doing, especially if they think they have met Messiah. And the 12 disciples certainly were in that grouping. We will say that Judas Iscariot, who was the only Judean among the 12, was looking for someone who had more fight. And that is part of the reason that he got frustrated at the end. And you realize that he is saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer and die. It's easy to see how you can make a different decision. After three years, in this case, after two years, they're asking the question, well, have we made the right decision to follow him? Question number seven, focus on Jesus' response to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> He's not calling Peter Satan. He is saying that he is aware that the powers of evil are in the air. And as a result, when Peter speaks, Peter is not speaking as Peter. He's speaking because he is being provoked by the tempter and the evil one. That's why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Above Peter's head, the conversation we will close with a focus on the third passage, the way of the cross. Verse 34 says, when he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I like the Luke version. The Luke version says, he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. What does it mean to take up your cross daily? What does it mean to deny yourselves? We've thought of the concept of self-denial, but usually it's for a season. And that is not a big sacrifice, but certainly we want to understand in context why it's important to make these sacrifices on a daily basis. So I ask again, question number nine, what do the verbs deny, take up, and follow mean to Jesus' listeners? And what do they mean to us today? Especially after we've made the decision to follow him. In closing, I ask the question, can you say that you are denying yourself, taking up your cross daily and following Jesus? May it be so in your life. Amen.